Welcome back. Now, Ryanair has said that around a dozen flights in and out of Dublin are cancelled today as part of a move by the company to accommodate staff leave. The Commission for Aviation Regulation has said that the airline will have to pay compensation to passengers whose flights have been cancelled with less than two weeks' notice. Joining me with that story and others making news this morning are Group Political Editor for Independent News and Media, Kevin Doyle, and Director of the Irish Academy of Public Relations, Ellen Gunning. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Um, I, I, I was trying to think of a really intelligent question to ask you about this, uh, Ellen, but the best I can do with this, what the hell is going on at Ryanair? It's a really intelligent question. I don't know, but their reputation is in serious danger. If you think about Ryanair, it's known for three things. It's known for cheap flights, it's known for reliability, and it's known for getting you there on time. Do -do 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 -do, every time you land, OK? They've taken away one of those major planks. We, we don't mind the fact that there are certain um, things that you need to balance in order to get a cheap flight, but you get a cheap flight expecting that it will take off when it said it would take off and bring you to wherever it said it would bring you. What they've now done is they've said 300,000 passengers are affected over the next six weeks, up to 50 flights every day cancelled. Now, these are passengers not only in Ireland, because I know we focus on us and what's happening in Dublin, but these are passengers all over the world who are being affected by this, primarily throughout Europe. What Ryanair has done is they've said they've contacted passengers up to Wednesday of this week. This isn't worth the fiddler's damn to you. If you're this side of Wednesday, fine, but what if your flight is on Thursday? You have absolutely no idea if your flight is going anywhere. I think the damage reputationally to them in the long term is going to be enormous unless they really get to grips with it. It's going to cost them money. I know they're an airline that's very profitable and they're very conscious of not spending as little money as possible. But it's going to cost them money in compensation for each of their passengers. It's going to cost them in reputation. I think what they should now do is bring a lot of people in or man the, the teams, if you like, and start telling people, publish a list of all of the flights that are going to be cancelled for the next six weeks. They must know what they are at this stage at least pay their customers the courtesy of telling them your flight is one of them. You don't need to tell them individually. You can send them to a website where everybody knows and then start looking at how do they reroute these customers? How do they find them alternative flights? I know they're obliged to do it, but how do they start giving them some TLC so that people say, look, there was a problem with Ryanair for whatever reason. It went radically wrong. They screwed up. 300,000 people were affected, but at least they did their best to look after us. Kevin, this is not an organisation that screws up that often. They are ruthlessly efficient and it's part of a brilliant business model. No, it's not particularly loved, but it is brilliant and it has worked really, really effectively, which is why they are where they are. They're going to take a big hit on compensation for the cancelled flights. They're going to take a big hit to their reputation. Now, you're talking about millions of euro here, multiples of millions. That decision would have been taken at the highest level. They're taking this hit, um, the cynic in me asks, why? Is there something else bigger that we don't know about? Yeah, it's kind of like Ellen was looking at it from the PR side of saying, I'd put the journalistic hat on it and go, we're only scratching the surface here because for Michael O'Leary and the guys at the top of Ryanair to make this decision, um, which is so detrimental, you wonder, what was the alternative? Well, if this is damage this limitation, is, how potentially bad was the damage? That's the question. What was the alternative to actually doing this? And, and the Indo does scratch at that this morning with this idea that 140 pilots uh, have been lost over, over recent months or years. Uh, Norwegian are opening up a base in Dublin that's going to challenge them there. Uh, and there seems to be a lot more kind of bubbling in the background. Do you wonder, like, it can't be as simple as, OK, the roster's shifted and now they're moving from a, a Mar a Mar an April to March to a, a January to December format. I mean, every company in, in Europe has had to do that over the last decade or so anyway. Uh, all the other airlines have had to do that. Um, and so you think there's no way Ryanair could make such a big mess of that. So is it that staff numbers are so tight, um, that pilot numbers are so tight that they weren't able to make that shift seamlessly, um, but they've had so much warning to do that. So you really wonder, it's, it's not... And in terms of EU regulation, they are one of the most active legally. They, they are constantly, they're in notice oh, yeah. all the time. They have a department in Ryanair that does nothing else except deal with this. So they would have known about the legal implications. Well, they Michael would O'Leary has made himself an, a Brexit expert. Uh, he, he's on Sky News and BBC every other week uh, telling the Brits about why they need to, to get on top of Brexit so that the aviation channels remain open between the EU and, and Britain. So, you know, when it comes to EU regulations, um, they're They'd be ahead they're, of the posse. Yeah, and they're quite pro-EU because it has opened <coughs> up the skies for them pretty much as well. OK, well, I suppose we'll just have to wait and see what emerges. Um, Leo Varadkar has warned uh, public service chiefs to perform or step down. Um, 
and he has said that he will publicly back ministers who, who feel that they have uh, senior civil servants who aren't doing their job and would like them to step aside. What an utter load of tosh. You cannot fire a civil servant, let alone a senior civil servant. So the idea that he would back his minister to, to advise senior civil servants to step aside if they're underperforming, who decides what's underperforming? Oh, I think this is fascinating. I think this is Leo changing, the, moving the goalposts, and I quite like it, I must admit. I is he like not playing the to the gallery, Ellen? He, um, no, I don't think he is. I think what he's saying is, see, if you think of any business, if you're a senior in any business and you're not performing, somebody calls you in, kicks your butt and says, you either shape yeah, up sorry, or you sorry, ship sorry. out. You use the word business. We're talking about the public service here. I know that, but the difference is public service has never applied business rules. I think he's starting to apply business rules. And he doesn't have the option of calling in a senior civil servant and saying you are not performing, therefore you are sacked. Because the nature of being a civil servant is you have a job for life. But I think what he is saying to his ministers is you can call them in and say, we're just not happy with what you're doing, you're cruising. We expect some sort of serious delivery for the amount of money, for the seniority that you're at. And actually, if you're not going to deliver, we're going to encourage you to take the package and resign. I, I quite like it. I think it might shake up the senior levels of the senior civil servant. To which the senior civil servant says, good luck with that, and I'll see you when you're back on the opposition benches in about 18 months' time, Kevin. Yeah, it strikes me that the last man who thought he could run a country like a business was one Donald J. Trump. Uh, and it's not going particularly well for him. But uh, to be honest, this Leo is, is running... But he is running a, a dangerous line of rhetoric that I don't think he can follow through on because the, the civil service is watertight. Yeah, you can complain and you can moan, but it, it strikes me that the last... I did an interview with Leo Varadkar shortly after he took office and he's heading for the 100 days this week, which um, for some reason every, we all use as kind of a, a watermark, a, a, a mark on the, on the calendar. But, and on that interview he said he would back the Garda commissioner if she took on top management in the Gardaí who weren't um, conforming to culture change and, and reform in there. And we all know how that less than 100 days later has worked out for her. Um, so it, it strikes me that it's it's a lot of talk, it sounds good. I, I can't see it happening. Well, I'm inclined to agree with Mark on this you, one. When you dig into, into it, he, he stressed that he wasn't threatening to stack uh, public staff, but rather he was going to ask them to step down with their pensions intact and an exit package. So. OK, it's a golden handshake for the dead wood. You reward the media. How do we fund it? You reward well, the media. Exactly. Where does the money come from? But you're moving them out of the way. They would be entitled to it anyway, presumably. They could actually take advantage of these packages. And what he's saying is, we're going to encourage you to take it much faster because you're really not contributing. I think if I was a senior civil servant, I would want to go with people saying he or she did a good job rather than I took the money and left. OK, um, speaking of, of um, spin and... Uh, you're so cynical, Mark. <laughs> I'm just wondering, we're, we're told that there will be a Fianna, a Fianna Fáil thinking this morning where uh, top of their agenda will be things like Brexit and the housing problem and all the rest of it. I would have thought the top of their agenda will be how the hell did Leo get eight points ahead of us in the opinion polls? And if he gets to 35 or 36, he can make a run for it and he'll probably get there without any support or supply uh, and whatever they call that arrangement. Yeah, I'm hitting the road to Longford after I get off this couch. Um, it's, it's, of course, we had the Fine Gael one last week, got loads of... Publicity. Fianna Fáil tend to be a bit more low-key with their thinkings nowadays, um, so they're only having a one-day event down in Longford. But you're right, uh, I mean, housing and Brexit will be the two top issues because housing is the one issue, well, health as well to some extent, but housing has become the issue that they can kick the government on. It's the one that Leo Varadkar is really struggling with. Um, so that will be top of the agenda, but in the context of how Fianna Fáil can, can use that to try and get back in the opinion polls. There was... The Leo bounce perhaps was a little bit delayed and that might be the argument and you will hear Micheál Martin is out talking to the media around midday and I can tell you exactly what he'll say now which is that opinion polls mean nothing. I, for the last election I told you they were all wrong, you told me I was on the way out and Fianna Fáil bounced back in that election from where they were at in 2011. So they'll discard them but you're right, below there's a little bit of worry because I think there's an assumption on all sides that there'll be an election next year um, and that gap is quite large now compared to what Fianna Fáil would have anticipated perhaps at this stage. I think the spin that Fianna Fáil will look at is how did Leo get so far ahead and how did he project so well? What are they getting wrong? I think that's what the real debate will be about. More work for PR consultants, I suspect. Hopefully. OK, listen, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have no shame. That's all I'll say. Thank you both very much indeed.